I want to welcome everybody who's here and say thank you so much for being with us in the San Francisco Dharma Collective online and for our well of being. This is the Wednesday nights that Chandra Easton and I co-host and we are um, yeah, really enjoying this opportunity to reach people in many different locations. We dearly miss being in front of you all in San Francisco and that togetherness and are working hard to find ways that we can approximate that togetherness and maybe even do something a bit different uh, that is resonant and realistic with the circumstances we are all in right now. So I, I want to get started with um, a, couple, a couple requests, actually. Um, we are in a very different time. Um, this is a very different way of being in Dharma and being in community together. And I was thinking about what are the agreements that we can really hold together as practitioners so that when we are practicing in this remote way, we're really getting the most benefit. So that is my motivation for these guidelines. And as I was writing these guidelines, which are truly just a suggestion, I realized they look a lot like the paramitas. And some of you may know the paramitas. These are um, essentially the qualities that really support us in our path towards waking up. And it's these qualities, we could meditate on each one of these and spend months to a year. I was really thinking about how would these qualities support my practice and how would I include them in my everyday life? So I wanna share a couple of these as it relates to being together in an online sangha. Um, the first is the one of sometimes called discipline, sometimes called a virtue or ethics. Um, and this one is an interesting suggestion. I've attended so many online teachings in these last two weeks, as many of you have. Um, and I really want to invite you um, to actually show your camera, um, to, to be able to, uh, to, so that we can see you um, and that we can see one another um, on gallery view. And the reason I say that is, you know, often what happens when we are attending something online is that we have, um, we have, our, we have the online teaching going, we're still checking email. We're like going and getting all the things we need to be comfortable. And our attention is just really compromised. And so this paramita or this quality of discipline, I really invite us to try this right now together as an online community. And I think probably the best way to do that is so we can all see one another in some format. If you feel more comfortable having a side view of yourself, if you don't wanna look at the screen, no problem but I really encourage and invite you to be able to be seen um, and be able to see others in a way so that we can kind of hold that for each other. Of course, we would love you to have your sound off. Um, and if you can really expand this to your whole screen so that you are not tempted to look at the email or the new sale on whatever item. I don't know about you guys, but I did like some serious weird online shopping binge dystopia yesterday and I didn't, even purchase anything, but I just needed to fill a bunch of carts. Um, so don't get in, don't give in to your online shopping needs during our time together to meditate. And then generosity. And generosity is such a beautiful teaching, this idea of how can we be generous. I got the good fortune to sit with Jack Cornfield today in an online setting. And he really reminded me that one of the greatest generosities we can have in this time is to take good care of ourselves. We really need to do so. And there's, there's, for many of us, a bunch of different ways this time is hard. Um, so the generosity is actually in that discipline. Give yourself the space to just be here right now for an hour and a half without multitasking. So right now, if you need water, if you need another cushion, if you need whatever, I invite you to do it so that we can really be together for our next time together. And give yourself that generosity of, not checking in on other things and allowing yourself to be here completely. Another thing I'd really like to in <clears throat> invite and remind you all is the, you know, the ethos of our center and coming together is really predicated on non-harming, being compassionate and open to one another. And you know, in this context of being online, we have a little less accountability than we do in person. And so in your chats and in your presence, um, please be generous and kind and recognize that you may not know where someone is coming from. And one thing I've noticed in this time of kind of accelerated stress is a lot of us are more irritable 
Does that sound familiar? We'll talk about that more today. And so to just be aware that some of the ways that we are responding to others right now might be a little more reactive or tight. So really kind of inviting this whole stance of non-harming. I also invite you to use this Noam and I and all the other teachers, we are learning as we are flying this plane. And please be patient with us. We are trying our best to make this technology work and really be supportive for you all. And, you know, I really also invite you to notice that you might be irritated by someone else in the Sangha. Like, how come their camera is so fuzzy? Or how come I can hear them? I mean, why didn't they mute themselves? They're drinking water. And to use that as another opportunity to really work on that incredible quality of patience and forbearance for ourselves and for others. Um, and then joyful enthusiasm. You know, this isn't like, oh, I wish it was Wednesday night and I could go to the Dharma Collective, but this is just, this will do, it's okay. Like, this is awesome. We have folks here from Seattle and from Los Angeles and all over. So I really invite you to take this into mind. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing for this moment. Happy to share that with other folks later if they would like um, and, and get your feedback as well. I think it's important that we as a collective, a volunteer run collective figure out what works for us online and how can we be together in a compassionate way. So we're gonna get started on our meditation here in just a moment. Um, in case any of you were not here when I first introduced our Paramita agreements, my invitation if it's okay with you, is to please have your screen on um, and create that sense of community and connection with one another. And I'm just gonna take a moment to gaze upon you all. It's really nice to see you. Thank you for being here. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful, friendly, familiar faces and unfamiliar faces. And now I get to see your living rooms, even better. <laughs> So the meditation tonight, uh, which I'm really looking forward to sharing with you because I really need it, um, is one that is a, a handshake with our emotions. And many of you who sat with me know this is one of my all time favorites. I really enjoy this opportunity to have an embodied awareness of our emotional experience. Um, and then what we'll delve into is another one of my favorite things. I feel like this is the week for comfort. This is the week where the shit has hit the fan we know this is gonna be a long haul. Many of us have myriad challenges and this is like the comfort food. So the meditation will hopefully give you that sense of soothing and comfort for what's here right now. And this teaching on cultivating emotional balance for me is, is where I get almost all of my inspiration. It's what uh, has you know, established me in this world as someone who just loves being a teacher and loves sharing ideas. So. Um, I'm really excited to share a basic format we use in cultivating emotional balance of working with our timeline. Um, I imagine some of you have had some difficult emotions this week. Uh, so yeah, let's work with those. Let's get into them. It's really uh, a rich time for understanding and hopefully transformation. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, as, we, as we are meditating together, I, I invite you to feel no need to look at the screen. Nothing exciting will be happening. Um, and you can have your gaze maybe somewhere above the screen. If you'd like to have your eyes open, you can softly close your eyes. Or you can have your gaze below, into your lap, into your hands. Feel as though that bell was an invitation to come home. And take a moment to just consider what that means to come home into the body, into the breath, into the mind and heart, which is here right now.
And even in this short period of time of looking for what it is to be home in our body, our mind, our heart, many of us will realize that our home is quite full right now. Many sensations, many ideas, thoughts, memories, impulses. So let's open ourselves first to the field of tactile sensations in the body. Begin by noticing what the sensations are right now at the forehead and between the brows. See if you can actually feel into an understanding of what it's like to be in your eyes. And invite the same embodied investigation of what's going on through the cheekbones, through the jaw, around the lips. And as we continue to notice and navigate the sensations of our face and our body, see if you can do so with a real spirit of welcoming. So for the next series of breaths, I'm going to invite you to notice what is here in the body already. What does it feel like in the chest and in the belly, the shoulders and the back? Some of us will immediately notice these more gross level sensations of tension or tightness or aches. And I invite you to look even deeper towards the sensations that really feel as though maybe they are an emotional residue from the day. Are there sensations you can feel in the chest, the belly, that don't have to do with digestion, that aren't about warmth or coolness, but where we can really tap into the felt embodied experience of our emotions? As we feel into the heart, we may notice grief or fear. And for a couple moments, just continue welcoming these sensations and gently looking towards them. And as we shift deeper into this practice, I invite you as much as possible to drop conceptions and ideas about what is happening and why, and to really feel into the body, the sensations themselves. Our conceptual mind of thoughts and planning has been so active this whole day and maybe for days on end. Let's move to a different mode of knowing a knowing from within the body itself.
And when our thoughts, memories, and images reemerge or insert themselves into our practice, gently relax, release whatever has captured your attention, and return to noticing the felt sensations in the body. now that we have developed and established a bit of this bodily knowing, we're going to give ourselves a small opportunity for inquiry, reflection, as though it were a small experiment of our own embodied emotions. And I want you to bring to mind a memory, maybe in the last day or two, of an experience that was mid-range difficult, not the hardest thing you've been going through, Maybe some sort of disappointment, some sort of feeling of loneliness, maybe an irritation, maybe a sense of guilt. Just choose one example that really comes clearly to mind. And we use this in a way to help us sharpen our knife, as a way to really know what it feels like to be in our body and emotional. Our memories are powerful elicitors of our emotions. So bring forth this memory, this challenging moment we might have had in the last day or so. Recall the details vividly. Remember what was said or unsaid, what was going on around you. Remember what you were feeling and thinking. For some of us, we will already start to feel the residue of that emotion reemerge. And for others, we may need to recall and remember a bit longer. The goal here is to bring forth a memory so that we can recall what it feels like in the body to hold and be with to give space to an emotional experience. I invite you now to completely let go of that memory, releasing it as though releasing a helium balloon and drop all your attention into the field of the body. Notice the shifts and changes that may have occurred by bringing this memory forth. What does it feel like now to be in the eyes? What's happening with the jaw, the throat, the chest, the belly? Attend closely and attend kindly to these sensations in the body. This may be unpleasant, but feel or imagine as though you have enough space for all the sensation. It becomes too unpleasant, no problem to open your eyes, take some breaths into the belly. As you keep meeting the sensations in the body, keep meeting them with maybe greater and greater kindness, welcoming them in as though an old friend.
Notice how the sensations may shift and change and even start to dissipate a bit. See if you're breathing in some space around the sensation. Finding that the emotional experience isn't totally dense or opaque. There are strong feelings and there is also space. Our mind may want to keep replaying that memory, keep understanding, analyzing, shifting or changing, keep releasing thoughts, images, escapes or distractions. And for a couple more sustained moments here, know the body from within the body, know the body with kindness. And while still keeping your eyes closed, expand the sphere of your awareness and concern to recognize that everybody who's on this call together, each of us, is facing and working with an emotion that was hard, maybe still is hard, and a situation which we may or may not have any control over. Just feel the tenderness of that common shared human experience of struggling with emotion. Now more than ever, the shared human experience of emotion is so, so clear. And let the goodness of that interconnection really fill the space of your heart and your chest, opening it wide. And consider for a moment, what would be truly kind or soothing for yourself? What would be a way in which you could meet yourself as though you were your own best friend? Maybe this is a single word or phrase. Something like, I love you, or I care. Or this will pass. Really gift yourself that nourishment of being kind. Drawing in your own kindness through your inhale and extending out that kindness through your exhale. Feel the virtuous cycle of that kindness coming in and going out and saturating the whole field of your body, your heart, your mind. And then again, expanding your field of awareness and concern. And imagine sharing this kindness to each of us on this call together right now. Inhale, drawing in this comforting kindness. Exhale, extending it out.
And as you are extending out, remember to receive and take in. You too are being essentially bathed in kindness from all virtual directions. Just two more breaths here of drawing in and extending out. And then releasing all this kindness, intention and aspiration and returning back to know the body from within the body. Notice how the body feels now. Gently and kindly, just follow the sensation. Thank you all for your practice. So as we get started, I'd love to know from folks in the chat once again, what was the emotion you were working with? Can you share with me? You don't have to say the details per se of what it was, but what was the emotion? Was it fear? Was it guilt? Was it anxiety? Was it jealousy? Let's work with our emotion vocabulary here. Frustration, defeated, guilt, irritation, loneliness. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. And can I, can I get a sense from folks, just by visually raising your hand, were people able to feel the emotion in their body? Did you feel the emotion in your body here? Okay, cool. Looks like a majority of folks, great. And, and how about, were you able to have some relief or invite in some of that kindness through the process of meditation? Did that work for folks? Okay, it is possible in that meditation of handshake that we can get stuck. Um, we can really have a hard time letting go of the emotion itself. We can just end up re-triggering it and we spend most of the meditation kind of stuck in the embodied feeling. That's also okay. And just as instructive and useful for us to see that habit and pattern of really how we re-trigger emotion. One important thing I wanna share with you about emotions is that they actually only last at the physiological level for about 30 to 90 seconds. So for many of us who feel as though our emotions last hours, days, maybe lifetimes, 
that really is a dynamic process of us hooking with our emotion and our thoughts, right? So um, I will share my example. Um, I am fortunate to know that um, my mom wasn't able to connect to Zoom, so I can talk about my family um, tonight without worrying that she'll be watching. Um, so I had a phone call with her today, and the episode I remembered um, was feeling frustrated with her, and then feeling frustrated with myself for feeling frustrated with her. Double header. Anybody know that one? Uh, it's especially poignant and prominent for us practitioners. Like we not only feel bad, we then feel bad about feeling bad. So I was working with that feeling of frustration. And I could imagine that for the entire rest of the day, I could continue that emotion experience by just thinking, oh, Eve, here you are teaching a class on cultivating emotional balance tonight. And look at you, you got frustrated with your mom. What a sweet lady, she's going through such a hard time. Right, And so we can really prolong and elongate our emotion episodes by rethinking it. And for many of us, our emotions are happening outside of our conscious awareness. We are not actually aware that we're re-triggering. It's kind of going on somewhere in the background. And we end up elongating this physiological response to our emotion. And it's actually taking up a lot of bandwidth. So even though we're not directly focusing on it, there's somewhere in the background this sense of frustration or irritation that may kind of extend for hours, maybe even longer. So when we look directly at our emotions, what we have an opportunity to do is to somewhat understand them. So in that handshake practice, what we did first was essentially get a sense that our emotions are embodied. And not only is this scientifically true, meaning that there is an interoception that we have with our bodies, when we are able to put our mind and focus on our bodies, instead of in that ruminative cycle, we've already gained some space. It's already helped us a little bit. So that simple move of going from the emotion happening entirely in this kind of imagined ruminative state into our body is a really important first step, crucial first step. And we can do it in the moment, actually. So for many of us, we're pretty aware of what happens in our body as we become frustrated, as we become fearful, right? So, um, you know, my, my main example of uh, anxiety today was going out in the world and trying to get food and someone standing what I perceived too near to me. This is now a, a common experience. And I felt so much clenching and tightness. And even though it was really protective and helpful, our emotions are enormously functional. They don't just arise to get in the way of our well being, they are there to help us do an important job. And in this case, one of my, my most important um, functions as a human being right now during the pandemic is to stay away from other human beings. So there was my fear doing its job. And yet I can still recognize like, okay, here is that activation. Here is this clenching in the jaw and in the neck. And I can invite myself to, in that moment, relax and be at ease and move away, right? And just do what I need to do. So it's a really useful process, this focusing on what is the embodied experience of our emotion and actually starting to develop some kind of familiarity with what it feels like in our body as we become emotional. Um, I would be, um, I'd be here, I'd, I'd be curious um, if folks would be able to share any information about where do they feel in their body, these emotions, if you could write down the kind of areas, that would be really helpful. So in the heart, the throat, the belly in the throat, the belly, the stomach, forehead, chest, heart and chest chest and shoulders. Yes. We have some agreement here. This is almost a scientific, scientifically good enough sample. Um, you hear very, people say, very few people saying, um, I felt it in my elbows, right? Or in my earlobes. And I'm being kind of silly, but I actually think it's really important for us to point out that there are, there are certain places we can reliably check in. So with everything we have to remember these days, how do I start to develop my embodied emotion awareness? 
I can check out my belly, my chest, and my face. And if you want to just keep it simple, check out your face. We have these 42 different muscle groups in our face that are designed to help us emote and respond to one another. And also, they're an area where we're carrying a lot of tension. So I don't know about you all, but I've been experiencing quite a lot of grief in the last week or so. Just a heartbreak for our world and what's happening. So much uncertainty, so many losses, right? All the things I thought I should or could or would be doing. Um, and I uh, am really fortunate to be working with a big group of healthcare providers at UCSF right now and feeling the residual sorrow of what we know will come in terms of ongoing incidences of illness, sickness, and death. And for us as practitioners, this is really, it's just a, a parting of the veils, right? We meditate on this all the time, that there is this impermanence, there is this unknown. And yet, the grief for it is totally appropriate and totally beautiful. And we can miss out on a lot if we try to deny, like, oh, no, no, all these silver linings. Yeah, this is hard, but like, I actually really love staying at home. I'm like, that's cool. That is wonderful but also allowing ourselves to be authentically in touch with our grief. It is a good emotion for us to practice because there's probably a lot more ahead. I'm not trying to be uh, negative here, but just the reality of um, the things that we are missing out on, the reality of challenges financially and otherwise. So how do we constructively work with our grief? Well, I, I was gonna start with anger, but here we are with grief. So we work with our grief in a really unique way because what grief really wants is comfort. It wants connection. And so one way to work with our grief is to be here together. And as I look out at you all, I think all of you know what it is to feel grief. And all of us know what it is to feel alone in our grief. And can we just remember that we are not alone in our grief? and tender and hard as it is to face it. It's, it's such a beautiful emotion. I don't think we would have a single poem and very few good songs without grief. There's such a gener generative capacity to our grief. It's so rich. You know, I would really invite you to just to not miss out on it and to recognize what it needs. I would say that the biggest, one of the biggest hazards of this isolation that's happening is we can hide our grief in a, in a greater way than ever. In our environment of evolutionary adaptedness, um, some of you know my dad is a um, emotions researcher and was kind of a, a wild man in his time. He went off and lived in cultures that were very far removed from our modern context. And he got to actually see how our ancestors lived. And the way our ancestors lived largely was in these small tribes in which, uh, for example, in the tribe that he visited, there was no doors on any of the huts. You can't hide your grief there. There's nowhere to go. So the grief becomes a commonly processed experience. And so how do we invite the opportunities for us to share our grief with others? And, you know, one way, of course, is of coming here together. Um, and if those who feel willing I would love to hear from you again in the chat. What are you missing right now? What is bringing you grief? And as we are writing and as we are sharing, can we do so with so much compassion and love? Hmm. People missing their family, missing their students and their work, hugging, concerts, Hugs, 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 I feel that. Family, safety. Yeah. Playing music with people. Yeah. Certainty, connection. Hmm. So can we just take one moment here together, even as people are still typing, and really allow in this feeling, this invitation to turn towards our grief. That we are missing hugs, and we're missing connections, and we're missing concerts and life events.
that there was a general feeling of sadness for losing work, livelihood. And imagining that as much as this grief is filling us, there is still more space and kindness that it can fill. You feel as though we were holding our own heart. We may feel heartbreak, but we actually can't break this heart. There is an infinite amount of love. And through our breath, just doing a very simple practice of inviting in these shared feelings of grief that we miss and extending out a real heartfelt compassion for each of us. Inhale, drawing in and recognizing, being incredibly aware of our shared grief and exhaling. May each and every one of us feel connected and comfort in our grief. And maybe putting one palm on the heart. And taking a couple moments to notice the sensations in the body. Becoming familiar with this imprint of grief, what its residue is like when we let it in. Remembering this grief has so much to show us. And then softening through the eyes, softening through the jaw, softening through the heart and belly. While feeling in a brightness and strength coming up through the spine. Strong back and soft front. And gently releasing the palm if you've had it there and just coming back into our shared space. Again, I would love on chat to hear from folks just maybe one word of what you're feeling now. Tender, patience, mm. warmth, space. Tired, yes. It's actually really exhausting to turn towards our emotions. You know, there's a way in which we really let it in. Yeah, and sad, yeah. One of the great gifts of this time is the authenticity. Um, those who know me and especially my SF Dharma crew, we go authentic all the time. We're never holding back. But that we get to have this level of authenticity with others these days too is so beautiful. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift us a little bit to move towards another emotion we may or may not be familiar with in this time and that arguably is really connected to the sadness. And that's our feelings of frustration and anger. That has been coming up a lot in the work I do in healthcare. Very understandable reasons. Why didn't we start testing sooner, right? Why aren't there more protective equipment? Why are people risking their lives to just, you know, offer basic services? And that anger, um, I wanna point out, is incredibly justified incredibly real and palpable. And as every emotion, I mean, anger has a very important function. Sadness, as we all experienced, it kind of allows us to go inward, to kind of almost like come back home into the body, into this tender place. And anger brings us to the forefront, right? It motivates us. 
And for some of us, it's more comfortable to be angry than to be sad. Does that sound familiar out there at all? Yeah, yeah. In sadness, there's a way of surrender that is really beautiful and also really, in some ways, can feel not very powerful. So anger gives us a different kind of feeling, some way in which we can feel as though we are right and someone else is wrong. And that gives us a purpose. It gives us, in some ways, action and things to do. And it can really um, be, as we know, enormously destructive if we're not kind of keeping up on uh, vigilantly how we're responding to that anger. So I want to share with you guys a very a simple graphic um, in, in just a moment here. And, and this is an emotion timeline. And when we're thinking about emotions like anger, the way that we can really start learning from them is learning what triggers them, how we experience them, and how we respond. So often we think, well, I'm angry because that person is an asshole, right? Simple. I don't need a timeline. I know what happened. <laughs> and yet, <laughs> there's more to it than that. There's actually quite a lot that goes into the triggering of our emotion. And there's also a lot we can learn from what triggers the emotion into how we respond. What most of us want to do is change how we respond to emotions. If you want to get rid of your emotions, I actually want to change your mind. Don't get rid of your emotions. It would be a very unsafe world. It would be a very boring world. And it would be one in which we really weren't able to take advantage of the challenges and opportunities that come every day. Really important. So then how do we work with our emotions as we start to understand maybe what's kind of right underneath them. So I'm going to share with you all here this graphic, my high tech slideshow. Okay, here we go to our paramitas. So this one is very simple, trigger, experience, and behavior. So we have a trigger to our emotion. We have some kind of felt experience and we respond. So if we think of this example, I'll, I'll use an example from this um, uh, healthcare provider friend about the trigger was um, she got an email saying who was and who wasn't able to have a mask on that shift. Her experience was one of enormous rage and anger. And her behavior or response in that moment was luckily she has some practice. So she did take a couple breaths. And then she realized she actually had to kind of completely leave where she was and take a walk around the unit of the hospital before she wrote a response. The level that she's at, she's expected to respond and um, kind of then give out the recommendations. So she has quite a big role there. Um, if we get a little more complicated, just a little, we can see here just one thing I think is really, two things I think are really important. Her triggering event right here was the email. But even before that triggering event, there is a precondition. The precondition is, at this point, very shared for many of us. The precondition is we live in unbelievably uncertain times. It is really hard to feel stable. Things keep changing. We do not know what is happening and we don't know when it will change. That is a precondition par excellence. Often when I'm teaching about emotion episodes, our precondition might be I'm tired or I'm hungry. And that's pretty unique to us. But right now, collectively, we actually have a shared precondition. And then what is happening in terms of the actual event. So she gets this email that says, you know, here's who is and here's who isn't allowed to wear masks in this next shift. That in and of itself is quite upsetting. But whenever we have an event, we have to recognize that there's a big part of our own perception, our own background. And for in this example, she has worked in this department for a decade. She has many relationships. She knows the history of it. And up until this moment, the person who wrote her this email, they have a relationship. So when we look at our emotions, especially our emotions of anger, it's so important for us to remember this database. What am I bringing in to this experience? What is the precondition? What is the world bringing in to this experience? And especially in this example, it's not as though this email would ever make you not angry. <laughs> this is a very upsetting email where you're being asked to make impossible choices. But there's a lot of ways in which our anger 
is potentiated by our own personal past and by the circumstances of what's happening. So for my example, sorry to switch examples, my example of speaking um, on the phone with my mom earlier. My precondition today was I had all these different calls, I had a little bit of time to make lunch and, and connect with her. So I was busy, right? I was agitated. I have the COVID jitters or whatever they are, this feeling of just ongoing anxiety. Um, the event was, uh, you know what happens between your family members, they say something and you're reminded of um, uh, some, you know, it just kind of goes into this deep database of like, you always stand up for that person and you never stand up for me. And, um, so there was a lot of database going in there. And then I can really understand the emotion in much clearer light, right? It had been someone else who said the exact same, ex same thing of, oh, maybe, you know, maybe you're too busy right now. But when it comes from someone you have this whole um, database with, it means so much different. Then we look at this timeline and we recognize that as we experienced during um, our handshake with emotion practice, that we can have very kind of specific physical felt sensations in addition to the way that we are thinking and changing the way we are thinking as we become emotional. And then how we respond, right? How did I respond to this? Did I respond in a way that was helpful or unhelpful? I would say initially my response was to feel bad um, and frustrated with myself, and, and that's not very helpful. That's a destructive response. And then the post condition for that, luckily for me, was that I, I really took a moment and said, wow, this is a really hard time for you. And you're being asked to do a lot, and it's okay. Nobody has the answers. You definitely do not. So that was a real relief, right? And it's really interesting to try to work through our emotional episodes in this way. To really think of not, oh yeah, I was really angry, and it, and it was bad or I was really angry and they really deserved it. But to think of what made me angry, what really contributed to it, what's really important. Um, I would love to hear, I know this is a bit complicated. Are there questions from folks that you can share and chat about how you might look at an emotion episode or how you might understand one? Oops, went into the void there. I think I stopped sharing. Okay. Any questions from folks on using that emotion time lens? Okay, I see here. Aha, great question, Cassandra. She said that sometimes her emotions feel more like a whole kind of um, chain of emotions. So what often happens with our emotion episodes is that they do go kind of right back to back. So I'm gonna share this one more time. Here we go. So what we can see here is we have this precondition. We have our trigger, our state of emotion, our response. And then we also can really like immediately with that dotted line at the bottom, we go right back to our precondition. So we can really have this experience where I'm feeling very frustrated, I'm trying to suppress it, but actually I'm walking around with this low level irritation and something just immediately fires me right back into it. And when we think of what is our goal when we are working with emotional awareness, our goal is to become aware of our episode of emotion so that we don't keep re-triggering and re-triggering and re-triggering, which is so common to do. And so we can have a series of emotions back to back to back to back, because we actually haven't become aware that we are emotional. An example often people say is, I don't know how that happened, I lost my head. Like what happened? And in fact you do, as I mentioned earlier, emotions can operate outside our conscious awareness. They're designed to do so, it's very useful. If we had to think about every response before we did it, we might not have survived as a species. We don't need to wonder, what is that crawling towards me fast? We have to escape the saber-toothed tiger, 
right? And in our day-to-day -day environment, that really rapid reaction can get us into quite a lot of trouble. Okay, I see another question here. Um, okay, how do you, this is, this is a classic and wonderful question from Tatiana, how do you work with a situation that requires an immediate response? You don't get to go and take a walk. So this is a really important point, especially about working with anger. Um, when we work with anger, we are not always able to take the time out that we need. And especially in the context of, um, you know, being of service to others, those of us who are healthcare providers or care providers in some way or another, our patients may act in ways that really piss us off. And it's not professionally appropriate or helpful for our therapeutic relationship or relationship um, to let them know how we feel. Nor can we say, excuse me, you've completely annoyed me. I'm gonna take a walk, I'll be back in 20 minutes. Not gonna work. So for many of us, one strategy that we're working with all, a lot of the time is suppression, right? Just pushing down the feeling. One thing I do wanna share with you is that suppression as a, um, as a way of managing our emotions is actually really taxing on our body. So the physiological response when we're suppressing is higher than if we are doing what's called reappraisal or being mindfully aware of our emotion. So I'll say that one more time. If we're suppressing our emotion, we are actually getting more activated. And if we are aware of the emotion saying, ooh, I am pissed right now, but I'm not gonna say anything, I'm gonna have to really process that a little later. That gives us a bit more space. So what's interesting here is this is where we really see the overlap between the psychological approach and the contemplative approach. So when we think of how would, for example, the Dalai Lama work with our destructive emotions, he would often probably quote this idea of Shanti Deva, who says, when we are angry, be like wood, which most people think like, what are you talking about, be like wood? But the idea here is how do we develop our patience? And what we need to do in order to develop our patience is to have a big understanding of what patience is actually for. The patience that we can exhibit during anger is really the very patience that allows us to develop a stable mind, a mind which notice when it's being perturbed, when the waters are actually being um, jostled around right on top. And so this idea of how do we work with our especially destructive emotional episodes from the contemplative point of view is we have to develop a sense of greater intention. Yeah, this anger is real. It matters. It's important. But it's not as important as me waking up so that I can be of service to all beings. And if that really becomes really our precondition, my precondition is my bodhisattva vow. My precondition is no matter what, my most valuable intention is peace of mind. Without peace of mind, I'll never make it any further on the path. I'll never be able to be of service to anyone. And it's interesting, but in that moment of anger, if we can have that as some, some, something resonant, we'll be able to move through that anger. We'll recognize that whatever our anger is about, it's merely a projection, a delusion, or it's a passing phase or phenomena. We kind of have to see, or in some ways interrogate, what feels like the form or the density of our anger experience and recognize it will pass. So that's a really long answer, Tatiana. So in, in the moment, um, you can suppress. But my suggestion is to develop both a really solid intention and clarity around what it is you are balancing your emotion for or about. So every day, you know, when you are feeling, when you're getting a sense that you might become face-to-face -face with a difficult emotional experience or trigger, right before you enter the door, right before you enter the hospital, right before you enter, think, my most valuable intention is that I want to have emotional balance. I want to be aware so I can be more available for compassion. And in the moment when you suppress, you might be able to even have that in mind. So in psychology, we call that a reappraisal, you know, a strategy of saying something like, um, it's more important for me to be patient than to be angry right now. Or this person doesn't know the harm they're doing. We can have a very compassionate reappraisal. This person, just like me, is suffering. But in order for us to really effectively have that reappraisal, that has to be almost always in our mind. We have to be infusing ourselves with that kind of compassionate reaction and response towards ourselves and towards others. 
which is why the compassion is really, um, it's really, you can't practice it enough. You know, if you practice it every time, there's even a twinge of discomfort or pain, then it becomes more like a reflex of the mind. You don't have to remember it amid your emotional episode. Okay, so another question here was, how do we discern between precondition and database? That one is a really tough one um, and a really important one. Preconditions are usually temporary and preconditions in general are important. I don't know about you all. Um, I've been having a hard time sleeping the last couple days. I'm feeling the increase of anxiety around the uncertainty um, and other circumstances in my life and family. And I recognize that for me, not sleeping is a huge precondition waiting to happen. So I can then prepare myself as I go through the day and um, you know, hopefully as much as possible, find places to take care of myself. Becoming aware of our precondition means getting familiar with the kinds of causes and conditions that really lead to our emotion. In some ways, we're like getting rid of the myth that emotions happen to us, right? We're saying that, yes, I, I don't have control, but I can really start to understand what are these causes and conditions that often have to do with um, you know, our sleep, our, our food, whether or not we've had a lot of emotional episodes that day. And with our precondition, we can think of it as something that is difficult or negative, right? Like I'm tired or I'm hungry or I feel overstressed or there's this pandemic, for example. Um, but the precondition can also be, as I mentioned, a place that we really are kind of, it's like a garden that we're planting something that we really are enriching and we're creating this sense of compassion and we're dedicating ourselves with such a clear intention. So that's the precondition. It's like what we're working with on the day to day. The database is literally the entire history of our emotional experiences up until now. There's a wonderful quote by a psychologist named Richard Lazarus and he says, emotions include the wisdom of the ages and our own personal experiences. So the wisdom of the ages means that, um, you know, we aren't like little baby turtles who are hatched out of a shell and we just head towards the ocean. It's all pre-programmed, right? We have a lot of need of care in the early part of our life, but there are certain things that we are born with, certain emotional kind of tendencies or triggers that all of us share. But then there are a lot of triggers that we learn throughout our entire life. So we think of the environment that we grew up in. Let's say, for example, that we had a sibling who was older than us and who was really impressive. And we were always trying to be as good as them. So we have this kind of feeling or this database that we're not really seen for who we are. We're always second best. And we bring that into how we see the world. It's as though it we're kind of operating there and part of our story or our plot line. So two of us on this call might have the exact same event. Maybe two of us receive a, a call back from a job and they say, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming in for the interview. We've chosen someone else. And maybe that happens to me and that happens to Claudia. And Claudia says, okay, well, thanks for taking the time. Guess it's not the right fit. But for me, because I had the sibling I was competing with, my emotional episode is one of first anger and then maybe it goes into shame and then regret. And that's, again, the same event. We were both told that we didn't get the job, but my database has such a different story. And so investigating our database with a lot of kindness is incredibly important. And we need to do so with a lot of care. It's really important in our spiritual practice to investigate this database. The Cultivating Emotional Balance training was actually designed at the request of the Dalai Lama because he saw that our difficult and destructive emotions we're getting in the way of our compassion. And that even if we became like accomplished practitioners who could have great focus and who could apply compassion, if we didn't truly integrate it into our lives, into an understanding of ourselves, it would get in the way again and again and again. And so that piece of our database of what's still in the way, it's really interesting to approach it from the psychological point of view, but in my opinion, if we really also approach it from a view of emptiness or a view of how can we really disentangle this idea of me and my past from what's happening in this moment, that's where freedom is. So if we experience an event as it is, 
free from our projection and free from how we think it is, then we have an opportunity to really be free from a lot of those old habits of pattern and thinking. Sounds nice, very hard to do. Very, very, very hard to do. And yet, what better place to put our effort and intention than to deeply knowing ourselves in this way? And this timeline is such a simple tool, um, but is a way that we can really um, start to unpack, especially our regrettable emotional episodes. So I see another, um, um, another question here. Okay, once you're aware of emotion, what kind of strategies or tools can you use to change your response from destructive or constructive? Oh, that's a million dollar question there, I would say. I'm gonna pull down this, um, stop sharing my screen for just a moment so that I can see people a little better. Aha, much better. Mm -hmm. One moment here. Aha, there we go. Great. Um, so how do we, once we are aware of an emotion, how do we move towards constructive and destructive? So this is such an important point. We think about our emotion responses and that we want to move them towards that which really supports us instead of that which really kind of maybe um, not only creates a good deal of problem, but that which can actually keep us cycling through the exact same thing. So from the psychological point of view, there's a couple of strategies. And you know, some of these, I really like sharing secular strategies, even in the Dharma context, because then you can share it with your family members, right? That's important for those of us who have a mixed or blended family. And some of the strategies that are really useful and really simple, the first one, is called affective labeling, which is a really fancy way of saying naming your emotion. So what is the emotion I'm feeling? Like, what is it? Is it that I just feel bad? Or is it that I feel irritated? Is it that I feel jealous? Or is it that I feel actually a little bit disgusted? Because each one of these, uh, it's important to know the difference for a variety of reasons, but as we are making that kind of attribution, what happens is that we're actually dampening at a neurological level our response. So here I am naming my emotion and I'm becoming less emotional. What's really funny is in a lot of these research studies, if you ask people beforehand, if I name my emotion, will I become more emotional? People are like, oh yeah, if I talk about emotions, I'm gonna get emotional. And in fact, it's the opposite. But here's a really important caveat. It's also the same if we name our enjoyable experiences. <laughs> so don't get too excited about labeling all your emotional experiences because you're also dampened what feels good. So there's something really interesting and nuanced there. If we want to kind of what is uh, what we call in CED, harvest the joy of our emotions, or if we want to savor the goodness of emotions, don't label it. <laughs> don't say, oh, I feel particularly content right now. Um, instead, really give yourself the moment of what does contentment feel like? And let yourself kind of just notice the feeling and let whatever images arise. So we don't want to label it. The label, which is sometimes called naming to tame, that's something we want to do with our difficult emotions. Another strategy that can be really um, useful, I mentioned already, is reappraisal. Um, and I really like people to get kind of motivated on reappraisal strategies. So I'd be curious from you all, um, what is a useful reappraisal strategy for someone who reliably annoys you in your life? So think of that family member, that colleague, maybe someone you're sheltering in place with. Um, when you become annoyed with them, is there something you say to yourself that helps? And can you share that in the chat? For me, I always know one that is you know, helpful um, is um, just like me, they want to be happy. Just like me, they're doing their very best. I'm appreciating the cats on this call. I would like to participate. Thank you, everyone, for the cats on this call. This is another cat on the call. 
Um, so yeah, anybody have any reappraisals that they use for their challenging people? What do you tell yourself to help build compassion? They are suffering. I have a wish for their peace. Yeah, beautiful. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, thinking that they're having a hard time, right? What we might notice here, these are all compassion reappraisals. And I really think, especially for anger, for us to be able to understand at a simple level, this person is just like me. Even if they are making atrocious decisions. So in the case of healthcare, when I teach in that context, one thing I highlight and I wanna share here too is your compassion doesn't mean that you accept as okay what is happening. It means that you recognize you getting caught up in that loop of anger is more costly than learning how to have compassion and forgiveness for that person. And that it's something you are doing to exercise this incredible capacity for compassion instead of say it's okay. Right? So we want to practice the kind of fierce compassion that is protective of us and protective of others. I like this. They're not doing this to annoy me. That's right. Um, that often we forget. Um, it feels so personal. Uh, they are human and therefore unskilled, just like me. Um, hmm, loving what is. I like that one too. I see their pain. They're reacting from their pain. And you know, this is really high level practice, this ability to have compassion. So the other reappraisals I'd like to share, um, I'm so loving your questions, so I'll continue to get to them. The other two reappraisals I'd like to share for anger, um, these come directly again from Shantideva. Um, one of them, which really motivates me, um, is that in the scope of things, how bad is this, right? In, in the overall scope, can I recognize whatever I'm angry about? It could be worse. It could be worse, right? That one can be a really useful reappraisal. Here I am so angry and generally it could be worse, right? And that means you don't have to know their history. You don't have to know their whole context. You just recognize the whole scope. Give yourself some space. And the other one, this is the one that really works for me and I love so much is whenever we can apply patience to our anger, we are practicing for future adversity. I assure you, no matter what the uncertainty ahead lies, there are going to be many things that annoy us and maybe outrage us and make us angry. So if we use each opportunity of frustration and anger, almost as though we were like little Jedi warriors or large Jedi warriors, and we are using this opportunity to really kind of hone our skill to not give in to anger. And this is why I also suggest for folks that there is no amount of anger too small to practice with. Even the tiniest annoying thing, like, whoa, why are, you know, like, why did Eve remove that slide? That's annoying. I was like enjoying looking at the timeline and notice, oh, well, just be patient. This is a work in progress, right? We can really develop our skill of patience for just about anything. Um, okay. So I had saw some other questions here. Here we go from Donna. Nice to see you, Donna. It's been a long time. <laughs> um, does one have to go back into their preconditions in order to dampen the reactivity to a trigger? So a lot of our preconditions, especially right now, so in our shared precondition of uncertainty and instability, we have no control, right? And what we can do with our precondition is let's, it's, we can almost think of it as like a balance sheet. So what we can do is, you know, we are, um, we are working with what might be a bit of an impediment or a handicap. In my case today, I was working feeling not very well slept. So then what else can I do? What else can I infuse in my precondition to help? Um, not only copious amounts of caffeine, um, but I gave myself the opportunity to lay down flat twice for five minutes. That's what I had. That's what was available for me, right? So what can we do to help work with our precondition? 
If we don't know we have a precondition, we're not gonna be able to do anything. So how can we get clear on what is it that, what are the kinds of things that really lead to um, our ability to face many of the triggers that arise for us? Okay, so I see here um, from Kathy, Kathy, um, I've done this with clear triggers, a clear event, but for me, the trigger is waking up and remembering everything that is going on. Plus, my work is focused on COVID-19, so it's knowing that I'm headed into focusing into that all day, feeling overwhelmed and defeated. Yes, Kathy, thank you for your question, and thank you for your work that you're doing. Um, you know, I think I, I similarly am, am working a lot in the kind of day-to-day -day response um, at a different level. And in this one, this is a really a beautiful, beautiful opportunity for us to keep intention in mind, right? Like keeping our clear intention in mind. Um, for many of us who do this work that is like directly in service of others, right now is, a, is an overwhelming and scary time, right? Um, and for those of us who are just trying to, um, maybe we have essential capacities or we're first responders, a lot of what's being asked of us is feels like too much and it's overwhelming. So the minute we wake up in the morning and we have that sense of, oh my God, yeah, right, it's the pandemic and here's the next thing that's happening. It's like we get no chance to get ahead of that precondition. Um, I'll offer a couple ideas. Um, one is that we, I do think morning rituals usually matter, but maybe now more than ever. My colleague um, and friend, the scientist Alyssa Eppel, has really looked at these small interventions that we can do right before we go to bed and right when we wake up. Some of these are very simple, like aromatherapy. Is there something that smells good? And that is an invitation, not that it like changes the reality of the pandemic, but it gives you a chance to actively be compassionate towards yourself as the first thing you do and the last thing you do. So what are the kind of rituals you can do at the end of your day or the beginning of your day that really give you that sense of care? Um, I brought my mala beads into my room so that I can start in the morning with a little bit of practice, right? Just so I have a sense of grounding in the very beginning. Many of you may be feeling like me that, um, you know, sometimes it's actually really hard to practice right now. There's not like that same stability in practice. Maybe there's too much agitation <clears throat> and we might need to use different practices than we're familiar with. It might be that the only thing we can practice right now is Tonglen or the only thing we can do is walking meditation. And so to be really creative, um, but back into that part of intention, when we're doing the work and it feels overwhelming, there's a reappraisal right in that moment. This overwhelm is natural. There is so much that is unknown. My intention is to show up compassionately no matter what. Nothing has changed except for our mindset. But our mindset, as we know, is one of the most powerful things that we have access and availability to. So what is the mindset that we can really infuse with that compassionate wish? Again, so it becomes reflexive. And you may be thinking at this moment, is Eve's only answer compassion? Um, and if it was, I'd be in good company because um, <laughs> I do think uh, a lot of folks right now are um, relying on compassion and that, you know, historically, there's no, no real downside to too much compassion. Um, I think it's really important for us right now to get clear on the most simple, small form of intention setting that we can get clear on. So this idea of like, may I be of service and help all beings? Oh my God, that's so many beings right now. So our intention might be, can I show up with compassion for the next hour until lunch? Can I be kind to myself for the hour when I get off work? So setting these smaller intentions that care for ourselves, but keeping in mind that it is for the sake of all beings. I also think the compassion practice that really allows us to remember that we're in this together really helps us regulate a lot of those feelings of overwhelm. Someone told me yesterday, and I just can't believe how much it helped me exhale, which is no one has the answers right now. No one. Like we're all in this free fall together. And it's not as though anyone ever did, <laughs> just for the record. But right now, like really no one has the answers. And so we don't have to know what we need to do and we don't have to know what's right.
all we can keep on doing is like coming back to that core of our values. Um, and, you know, we're so lucky to have the practice. We're so lucky to have um, some of these ideals and teachings that have come down for us. And it's, um, you know, it's, I feel grateful for that. Um, okay, so I want to look at maybe one more question here. Um, Preconditions, personal values. You know what's interesting? Um, this idea of ethics, I do think, should become part of our precondition, but it but it isn't necessarily. Most of us think about our ethics right before we meditate, if we're asked to come up with our intention, and at the end of our practice when we dedicate it. But ethics is not a living part of how we interact with the world and engage with the world. Um, as, as many of you know, um, I love talking about ethics. And I think if we had more attention to making ethics feel as exciting and juicy um, as compassion, that many of us would actually feel a lot less distress. Because what ethics really allows us to do is to maybe briefly experience the bliss of blamelessness before we go to sleep. So when we have ethics, we can think at the very core level, what our basic ethics are is one of non-harming. That includes not being harmful to ourselves and not being harmful in as many ways as possible. What would it mean to spend an entire day attending to not being harming? It would be, I'll tell you, because I've done it. It's painful. Like I see how much subtle harming, kind of like inner aggression, outer aggression, right? So I'm not going to like, like, we already have a lot on our plates. I'm not going to give you that homework. <laughs> but I will say that like looking at um, any ways we can be less harming to ourselves right now will be repaid in just an enormous amount in our everyday ability to feel balance and harmony. Because it's not as though these emotions are these separate things and the rest of our life is over here. Right? Our emotions, our, our mental events, our motivations, our priorities, how we exist in the world, they're all deeply connected. And again, we don't want to get rid of our emotions, but we want to be able to find our way back to a baseline of a calm mind as soon as we can. That's what we want. Operating from a calm mind means that we have a readiness for compassion. We have a readiness for whatever is needed of us. If we're operating out of an agitated state or operating out of a kind of fearful state or if we're overwhelmed for too long with our own grief, we are not available for the world. And we're really not available for ourselves. So that's how these all come together. Um, it's really beautiful to be with you all. And, you know, I would, I would love to hear, um, again, by chat um, before we do a kind of closing practice together of, from our night of considering these emotions, what would you like to carry forward? What feels meaningful? What's important? Calm mind, yeah. More space for compassion. Yes, Cassandra, yes, I will get back to you. A nighttime ritual of self-compassion, taking a pause. Of purpose, softness, patience, realistic intentions, <laughs> compassionate appraisals, just like me. Beautiful. All right, so I'm going to invite us to once again just take a moment to drop in. and really know the body from within the body. And take a moment right here to notice anything that is already okay or good right now. Maybe feeling some sense of connection or mutual understanding. Maybe feeling some sense of inner inspiration or intention. Really allowing ourselves to savor this mind state. Maybe it isn't great. Maybe it's just okay or not bad. 
letting our mind rest here in what's already okay. I'm taking a moment here to consider a heartfelt aspiration that everybody across the planet had the possibility to know a feeling of being okay right now. A feeling of connection, a feeling of opportunity. Considering for a moment an aspiration that all beings could know health all beings could feel safe, that all beings could develop a friendly and beautiful relationship with their emotions so that we could all understand each other and be free. Such a delight to be with you all. Um, I think many of you already know, um, but these videos are um, hosted on the YouTube channel for the San Francisco Dharma Collective. So they'll be posted a couple days from now if you wanna share this with anyone. Um, and the San Francisco Dharma Collective is a volunteer run Dharma center, now completely online. So we so appreciate your generosity in supporting us. And this has just been such a dynamic and interesting time as uh, Noam and Katie have really kind of helped usher us online um, so that we can be together in new and different ways. And I'm just so deeply appreciative of that. I know that this weekend we have some really special events. Um, anyone, Noam or Katie, do you guys want to talk about the, is it George Haas this weekend? Yeah, I actually, I have some late breaking news on that too. And then I'm going to hand it over to Mace, who normally talks on Wednesday nights and she'll pick up from there. Um, but George Haas is doing a three class series with us on uh, attachment theory informed meditation. And if basically he's drawing from techniques that inform many different traditions from Western psychology to um, some really hardcore dharma. And because in the middle of his class, he changed from an in-person class to an online class, this Saturday is the second in a three-class series, but if you register, you can join. Um, and if you register, he'll send you the video from uh, a week or two ago, so you can catch up and then you can jump in this Saturday. Um, and it's a really beautiful, healing, powerful, skill to add to your toolkit. So I'd encourage you to try that. Um, and then Mace, if you're there and unmuted, uh, do you want to take it from here? I'm here. Yay. Hey. I just first Eve, just, um, I think if, if all of you are feeling, um, the amount of gratitude that we're feeling over here, mm -hmm. um, for this connection, for this, for the Dharma, for the practice of emotional, um, intelligence for the wisdom and for the community, then um, our deepest hope is that you will help contribute. Um, Donna to help support the center um, financially. Um, the center, I'm guessing the rent still needs to be paid and it was already exorbitant because we are all in San Francisco and um, it's really for me right now important since I'm thankfully employed to help, um, you know, maintain people who are offering the teaching so beautifully so um probably the easiest way to donate is katie just put um in the web i mean chat. in the chat the website and if you go to the website the very first thing that you'll see is how to donate and it's a beautiful um community to contribute to um and i do believe a lot of merit um deep profound merit is generated by this community so please please generate <laughs> I was like helping Sorry. over here. Okay, we're done. Give freely and happily. Thanks. <laughs>